Jazzcast Pros. Welcome back to High Vibe Table Talks. This is your host, Marshawn Hargrave, and I'm so excited to dive into this episode. Amelia is a second time guest. I wanted to have this conversation because she just came out with a book, and I'll put the link to the book in the show notes. But by the end of the episode, you're going to understand the importance of female friendships and how to bring intentionality around that. We are going to talk about the stories that happen in our head when we do something vulnerable, like create a book, which is very vulnerable, and a really interesting story about comparison in regards to life benchmarks. So without further ado, let's get into this discussion with Amelia. If you're a woman contemplating your next move, you found the perfect podcast to empower your self-growth journey. Welcome to High Vibe Table Talks, the podcast to help you, the cautiously ambitious woman, remove mental barriers and take action now so that you can achieve your high vibe desires. And I'm excited to have my first duplicate guest you were on earlier in this season. Welcome, Amelia. Can you remind people a little bit about who you are and who you serve? Yeah. Um, So my name is Emilia Sipokowska, and I'm a career coach and founder of Sunny Side Up Coaching. And I really help people to define what they want out of their career and make sure that it uh, lines up with what motivates them, with what lights them up, to make sure that they're creating the meaning and having the impact that they want to have in the world with the skills and talents that they have. Tell us about your book. Tell us about the concept. Tell us what you want the reader to get out of it, the name, everything. Uh, The book is on female friendships. It was written as a collaboration with me and Yvonne Rodney. So she and I wrote this book about our own experiences and interwove it with some fictional examples. We did a survey for 110 women of ages between 20 and 75 you know, so they shared their perspective on different questions around female friendships as well. So we also wove those insights through the book. Very cool. Were there things that surprised you when the the answers to the questions came back? I think the most memorable kind of statistic that I realized through the questionnaire was just what a high percentage of uh, women will sort of back out of friendships that are no longer working by just kind of investing less and less energy in it over time versus, you know, having any kind of real conversation or breakup with a friend. Mm, That's really interesting. And what I love about this concept so much is that, I mean, just in conversations that I have with people in my universe, it's like, it's so hard to make friends after you're out of school. You know, there are so many friendships that are created out of proximity. You know, Mm -hmm. you're in the same class, you have the same friend group, you, you know, do the same sports. And then as you're kind of out of that and really busy with your career, with your life, with things, you have to be really intentional with who you're friends with and your energy because you Mm -hmm. only have so much energy. And so if you're putting them into relationships that aren't necessarily serving you or, or connected to your energy. It's hard. Yeah, definitely. And it's so great that you brought up that word intentional, because that's really, I guess the overall concept of the book is trying to get more intentional about friendships. Yeah. So being more intentional about the friendships already in your life and getting more intentional about friendships that you want to have in your life. And we actually do discuss the difference between an in, um, an intentional friendship versus one that's kind of formed out of convenience, right? It's convenient to make friends with your colleague um, because you work in the same building and you can go for the lunch in the same kind of radius. So, you know, you can take a friendship of convenience out into a more intentional friendship, but you have to get intentional about it and you have to really nurture that friendship and take action and follow up on things so that you can continue to nurture it Mm -hmm. and so that it can continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And as to your point as well about, um, you know, making friends now that people are out of school, um, this is something that I've found because I've moved, I have kind of done a tour of Ontario in the last 10, like 15 years. 
So because I moved around and I constantly had to build my network from the ground up, I became really good at making friends. So we do have a chapter on making friends in the book and I share real life examples and also my advice to highlight the nuance of of the approach, right? Because very often we think, oh, I already know how to do that. But then where do people actually stumble and where do things go wrong? So what you're saying is that anybody can do it. It's a muscle yes. that we just need to practice. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the biggest thing for making friendships is that like we don't want to be rejected, right? So number one, you know, we might meet somebody at a party and, you know, we don't ask for their contact information because they're like, well, what if they think I'm hitting on them? What if they think you know, I'm, I'm being weird in some way. What if my friend gets annoyed that, you know, I'm trying to hang out with her friend without her or whatever it is. So, you know, we're so scared of being rejected that sometimes we'll explain things away to ourselves. Like, oh, well, if that person wanted to hang out with me, they would have asked for my contact information or they, they would have followed up when we said, you know, we should meet up for a coffee, but they didn't follow up. So, you know, I guess they don't really I guess they don't really want the friendship. So we try to leave the ball in the other person's court where I'm encouraging people to say, well, what's the worst that can happen? Like it did actually, I think um, it was like 11 years ago, I was living in Ottawa at the time. And I asked this girl to hang out that I had met at this event. And uh, like I asked her for her contact information and she was like, I don't know. She says something along the lines of, oh, you know, my boyfriend and I are like really busy or something. And I'm like, oh, she thinks I'm hitting on her. Is that really like the worst case scenario? And, you know, that's more about her and her assumptions versus anything to do with me. Right. Mm -hmm. That if she thinks that somebody asks for her contact information, they're hitting on her. Yeah. And there's so many times where like we can make up these stories in our head that are so untrue. Yeah. And we allow them to like, stop us from taking any action. And really, if we just either ignored them or played a scenario in our brain that was more supportive, our life could be totally different. Yeah, exactly. So what was your favorite and your least favorite part of writing a book? Yeah. So my favorite quote about writing a book is that writing a book is nothing like thinking about writing a book. Um, I think we tend to romanticize it. We imagine, you know, a person at a coffee shop on a rainy day and they're typing away on their laptop and they're just writing down their brilliant insights. Or I think about that, um, uh, you know, Love Actually, the movie and the writer in it. And he's like alone at this, you know, cottage and, and he's like typing on his typewriter and all these papers, they fly away. Like, so I think that we really tend to romanticize the notion of writing a book. And then when you sit down to it, you're like, at least the experience for me was, you know, I would write down a sentence and then I'd be like, black, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. I I don't understand like how, you know, this idea in my head sounded so good. And then when I go to write it down, it's so weird. And so I would say the hardest part is um, just the vulnerability and that inner critic that comes up so loudly when we cement our words on a page. And, you know, I'm a big journal writer. Um, Like I love writing in my journal, but like, as soon as you start to think that, oh, somebody would read this and somebody would look at this, And what would they think about the way that I've talked about, like written this paragraph, your inner critic can come up really, really loudly. So I would say that was my least favorite part of it. My favorite part about writing this book was actually the, you know, the effect that it's had, you know, the really brilliant things that's come out of it that I hadn't anticipated, which is, you know, conversations happening with my close female friends, like things that we hadn't talked about before, or things that they hadn't known that I thought about, or like also affected me. And so it's actually been the bridge for a lot of conversations and also the reigniting of friendship. So that's been my favorite thing about it. Yeah. In entrepreneurship, I like to say it's the must be nices. Like it must be Mm -hmm. so nice to own your own business and you get to make your own schedule and you get to like just do whatever you want and like not report to anybody. And it's like, okay, yes. And the other end of the stick is you don't report to anybody and all decisions are yours. And like 
I think that same thing, we tend to romanticize it. Like, oh, it must be so nice to like write a book and sit down at a coffee shop and it must just flow for you. And it just must be, yeah. it must be so easy. Yeah. And you must be so creative. And it's like, that's a very small, small piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about how you pulled experiences from your female friendships, from your life, and writing about those in the book. Can you tell us about that experience? I think, you know, when you talk about vulnerability of putting it out there, but you're also putting vulnerability of your interactions with other people out there. What was that like? It's something that I think it was really important for me to share examples from my friendships and, you know, reflect on friendships that I've had over the years and, you know, and what they meant to me and what were some of the pitfalls or what were some of the rough parts, because like, I didn't intend to write any kind of textbook, (laughs) right. About female friendships or about social circles or whatever the case may be. Like, I really wanted these things to be real and grounded in actual friendships. So, yeah, so it was an interesting process. Like I definitely had some fears around, you know, how my friends would react to seeing our stories in the book, but the reaction has been really, really positive, uh, which was a really surprising benefit. Like I knew I had to put this out there. I knew that I really wanted to help other people navigate their friendships. And, but yeah, it was very vulnerable because I just didn't know, like, you know, what would my friends say about seeing themselves on these pages? Mm -hmm. So tell us more about that part. Like you said that you knew you wanted to get it out there. What did it start as? What was like the spark and what are some early beginnings of like, oh, I think that this is a project I want to take on. So it was a particular friendship of mine that really sparked the interest in writing this book. Like she'd been my best friend, you know, since we were in high school and, and you know, she and I went through a lot around the time of her wedding. She got married 10 years ago. And that was a tough time for me because I had insecurities that I hadn't realized were there. And I had this sort of anxiety about my life. And I think that without realizing it very often, we look at our friends as benchmarks for where we should be. Right. So we look to our friend and we say, they have this kind of job or this kind of relationship. And so that's where I should be in my life. Right. And I looked at her and her life as like a subconscious benchmark for where I should be in my life. And I wasn't there. And that created a a lot of anxiety for me. And I didn't know how to express that to her. It's hard when your friend, like you want to be happy for your friend and you want to celebrate them. And so you don't want to bring up any conversations about, oh, you know, well, I'm actually like really struggling with this, or I really don't know what about this, or, you know, this is bringing up a lot of fears for me. Number one, I didn't have that like conscious self-awareness that that's what was happening for me. I, I wouldn't have known how to have the conversation had I even thought to have it. And then three, you know, this pressure of, well, I should be happy for my friend. Like, this is the only time she's going to get married. So, you know, I can't put a damper on this, right? So it was this really interesting experience of somebody in my life kind of going through like the best, one of the best moments in their life and me kind of going through like a harder time. And I think that happens a lot in female friendships and in any kind of friendship where like, I don't know, your, your friend could have uh, just bought a new house and you just lost your job, right? Like that can happen. And so how do you, how do you navigate that, that experience of having opposite end experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was really what brought me back to this all the time, because I saw that as a time that was so hard. And I was like, what, what would I have done differently? Or how would I have navigated that? That affected our friendship. And I think that for some time, like we weren't as close as we could have been. And now thankfully, like we're closer than ever, which is wonderful. But it really nagged at me for a number of years where where we still struggled to find our footing after that experience. It really nagged at me to say, what did I learn? And how would I have done that differently, you know, if I were in that same spot again. Yeah, that's really, really beautiful. And and one of the things I love about like working with creatives like that is they're able to speak to 
previous versions of themselves. And it's almost Mm -hmm. like in this book, you're able to say like 10 year ago, me, this is the book that I wish I would have had because I, I would have navigated this experience very differently. Yeah, absolutely. So you did say that you had a co-author and that sounds like it brings on a whole another set of challenges and benefits. Can you tell us about what that was like? Yeah. So I'd love to tell you kind of the origin story of the collaboration, because I I think it's so unique and beautiful in itself. First and foremost, if I had not had a collaborator for this book, it would not be out in the world. So Yvonne has written, uh, I think, seven books to date aside from this one. So she is the experienced book author and she had known what this process would look like and I did not. (laughs) And um, so if it weren't for her, like this book would not exist. So yes, that being said, she and I met at a conference in January, 2020. Uh, It was actually a career development practitioner conference. And I had attended her session that was about, you know, dreams that you've had on hold for a long time. What is that dream? And how can, how can you get unstuck on it? And so the thing that I had written down was, you know, writing a book. And so I went up to her at the end of the session and I said, you know, this is like, that's my dream. That's something that I've thought about for so long and and I haven't made it happen. So she said, oh, well, you know, here's my business card. Uh, Call me when you get back to Toronto and we should talk like our like book writers should stick together. So I took her card. I called her when I'm in Toronto, when I got back to Toronto and I explained to her the concept of the book. And she was like, I have never collaborated on a book with someone I have never offered or wanted to collaborate with someone, but I love this concept. And if you would like, I would love to write this book with you. And so she was someone that I had just met. And then all of a sudden, you know, we were meeting up at her house and we started working on this book together. And it was, a yeah, such an incredible journey and a friendship that formed through that. But it's just so amazing what happens when you follow your intuition, both from her side and from my side, right? Like my intuition told me to mention to her that I want to write a book, not ever in my wildest dreams thinking that she would, you know, say, oh, well, you know, we should write this book together. And then for her, she was like, I must be crazy, but I'm going to offer to, you know, collaborate on this book with somebody that I like, I've met exactly once for like five minutes. And she's really the the person that got us to where we are today because she's the one that was like, okay, like, let's get on it. Where, where are the edits? So when are we meeting? You know, because it was just a, a process that I, I didn't imagine it would be so difficult. Mm-hmm. So having that accountability and yes. someone from experience and someone to just pull you along yeah, was really, like you said, this book wouldn't be in the world if it weren't for that. So that's really really great. And I love that story of like, you just said, Hey, here's my dream. Yeah. And the universe kind of came together for all that to happen. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so cool. Very cool. So you were extremely busy um, while going down this path because the book writing process is a lot. And you also got engaged, planned a wedding, had a wedding. We're building your business, building your team. Tell us how you managed all of those plates in that schedule. It was definitely difficult. I think I realized at one point, I think it was near the end of last year where I said, okay, I've continued to add to my plate (laughs) and I haven't removed anything, but I haven't, I don't magically have more time um, than I did. And so I think part of that process was letting go actually of subcontract work that I was doing to make a little bit more space, but really it was just continuing to come back to, okay, what are the things that I have on the go? How can I move the needle? And um, yeah, like your group was so great for that because that's one of the things that I decided to focus on. We can talk about the things that need to get done for the week, but what if I just focus on those things that I know if I don't intentionally move the needle, I won't because everything else will get done. It's more reactive. Mm -hmm. Um, And so making that distinction between like reactive will happen come hell high water, because like I've made the commitment. And then what are the things that are more proactive, and I have to be on them myself. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like it would be silly to put on your list. Oh, I need to make sure I brush my teeth every day because like, that's just (laughs) so naturally built into the part of our process that you don't even have to think about it. But sitting down and taking time to edit your book is something that can easily get pushed to the side. Yeah, absolutely. In kind of layering the idea of bringing intentionality to it and back to like your earlier when we talked about like being super intentional with your friendships, let's say someone does like a a friend inventory at the moment and they're not spending as much time with the people that they want or the people that are in their lives just aren't energetically where they want to be spending their time. Mm -hmm. What are some either questions they should ask in that inventory or steps if they're like, oh, I really need to weed my garden of some of my current friendships to create space for other friendships? Yeah. I think the most important question is how does this person make me feel? You know, when I finish like a phone call or a hangout with them, how do I feel at the end of that? Do I feel more energized, more excited about life, more excited about everything, or do I feel drained? So it's kind of interesting too, because I started writing this book in 2020, which began this evolution of me really focusing more on myself and my personal goals, where I think that for the majority of my life, I was focused on other people and I was focused on you know, my relationships, my friendships, you know, how I could support others and how I could give to others. And so it's interesting that these three years that I was writing this friendship book, I was actually more focused on my own personal goals, which of course, if I hadn't been, then I couldn't write a book because I wasn't doing that for anybody else. Right. Well, minus, minus working, you know, with a collaborator and then knowing, okay, I'm being held accountable. So yeah, that, that that really did help. (laughs) That really did help. It's like that, you know, relationship uh, orientation will never fully go away. (laughs) Uh, The most important thing is asking themselves how they feel around others. Yes. How they feel around others. And so it's interesting how in these three years, you know, I've been a lot more intentional about, you know, who I'm spending time with and who I'm investing energy with. And I found that a lot of times, like I would reach out to a friend because I felt guilty because I felt like, oh, you know, if I don't reach out, this person will be kind of like low key mad at me. And I just decided not to feed into that anymore. I decided not to feed into it anymore where I'm, you know, building a friendship out of guilt. Like it should be because, you know, I want to spend time with this person and I feel great with this person. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing to ask yourself, but I do actually have a list of questions in the book and it does sort of depend on each person individually, because like you might have different values, right. And you might invest in your friendships for different reasons. So, but those are some good questions to kind of see like, which of these resonate with me. Mm -hmm. Another question to add on to that, as far as like, when you do have to weed your garden, how do you not use the idea that like, because I'm letting them go, that's me saying I'm better than them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a fear that plagues people when they're like, oh, I have to rid this friendship because I'm, I'm better now, but, and that's Mm -hmm. not necessarily the case. But it's a fear that they think that in doing so, that's what their intention is. So it's so interesting because in a way, that's kind of the guilt aspect, right? Where it's like, I feel guilty if I'm telling myself that I don't want to spend time with this person because maybe this person will think that I think that I'm better than them or yeah, in some way different or, you know, more important or whatever it is, right? And so in terms of letting go of that guilt, it's a work in progress. And I would say the best advice that I have on that is not to feel like you can release that guilt all at once. But, you know, when you have that urge of reaching out to a friend that, you know, drains your energy or maybe, you know, has a very different goals and like lifestyle um, and you want to put more energy into like what you're trying to create in your life. Um, What I would say is kind of let go of that guilt one bit at a time, right? So just stop answering that urge to reach out to that person. And so it's not something you'll let go all at once, but it's something that like you can stop feeding into that urge to reach out to someone. Yeah. So it's a, it's a shedding process and it's 
small bites at a time. You don't have to yeah. just like completely cut that person off altogether and just just slowly ease into yeah. that mindset and intentionality. Even for the friendships that I do want to cultivate, I still want to continue to leave enough space for um for everything that I'm doing in my life and you know, whether it's my business, whether it's like my relationship, uh, like my romantic relationship, you know, whether it's like time with uh, my family or in nature or in on fitness. So the other thing that I would say is like, I used to feel really, really guilty around not being able to make space for someone within like the week. So I think that's another thing like to remember is just to really um, focus on like, when do I need that recharge time? And don't feel guilty about saying that you're busy when you're really busy relaxing or like recharging from your week or whatever it is. So that's so important too, to continue to carve out that space and like make plans further in advance if needed to make sure that you're not nurturing your relationships at the cost of your own like health and energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your relationship with self is a crucial part of that intentionality as well. Yeah. I can't believe how fast that time went. It's so crazy. Mm -hmm. This was really, really fun. So where can people find you, find your book? Um, We'll leave all the links to the in the show notes, but tell us more about where people can connect with you. So um, I have my own website, sunnysideupcoaching.ca. And um, so people can book a call, yeah, or they can send me a note through there and also LinkedIn. And I'm on Instagram at sunnysideup underscore coaching. And in terms of the book, uh, it can be found on Amazon now, uh, which is really fantastic. Um, So if you want to find it, it makes a great holiday gift. Yeah, I think those are all the best ways to reach me. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amelia. I'm so happy for you, proud of you. This is so incredible. And as I've said before, like the ripple effects that this book has already had and is going to continue to have as it is out into the world is just really, really incredible. So thank you for putting your time, energy, vulnerability into something so amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for giving me the space to talk about it and to share it with the world. How awesome was that conversation with Amelia? I hope you took so much away from it. I know that we did this interview on a Friday and I was just like vibing the rest of the day because it just was such a cool conversation. Make sure you go grab a copy of her book. Again, the link will be in the show notes below. If you like this podcast, High Vibe Table Talks, don't forget to subscribe. We will see you next week on High Vibe Table Talks. And remember that big dreams and small steps will transform your life.